Thank you. In April of last year, I was in rural Tanzania working on a documentary film about astronomy and how it opens the mind to uh, an awareness of a much larger world. I had the fortune of meeting Chuck from the US and Mponda from Tanzania. They both work through an organization called Telescopes to Tanzania. They deliver hands-on science uh, to, to the classroom. Following a series of interviews with both teachers and students, I was packing up my gear and, and uh, shutting down my camera when Catherine, this young learner, said, sir, I have a few questions, do you mind? I said, no, of course. So I sat back down in the chair in front of her. And she began with, is it true that we live outside the earth and not in it? Now I laughed, I almost smiled, and I pointed out the window at the sun and the growing clouds and storm. And I said, well, we're not underground. But Mponda, who was sitting to my left, said, no, this is a serious question, you need to answer it. So I turned back to her and I apologized, and I said, I'm sorry, can you please repeat your question? She made the shape of a ball with her hands. And she said, do we live on top of the earth or do we live inside of it? Now, I didn't know if I should laugh or cry, but I realized that she was talking about celestial spheres, an ancient concept that the sun, the moon, the planets, the stars all reside on multiple spheres of some unknown substance, that our universe is very, very small. I confirmed that we do, in fact, live on top of the Earth and that our Earth orbits around the sun and that the sun revolves around the center of the galaxy, and she was relieved. She had just looked through a telescope for the first time one month earlier, and it got her thinking, and she had lots of questions. Then she went on to ask about weather prediction, something she had heard about. She wanted to know how we predict the weather and whether or not she could grow up to be an airline pilot. Now, I have to say that I thought perhaps that Catherine had missed a few lectures or maybe she wasn't paying attention in class, except that an hour later I was interviewing a geography instructor who a year earlier had looked through a telescope. And when he saw the moons of Jupiter orbiting that large body, he recognized that our planet too orbits the sun. And it got him thinking, and he started reading and learning and doing research, and he said, he sits back in the chair, and he has this huge smile on his face. It's the smile of someone who's about to say something really profound. He says, do you know there's so many galaxies we can't even count them all? And then he said, I see now that we are so small. And that's a phrase that I heard repeatedly throughout the two years that I was working on this film. Elvirdo, a secondary learner in Sutherland, South Africa, said, I used to think that the moon invented its own light. And then I learned that the moon is an object which reflects light. And I asked, where does that light come from? Willie Yee, a retired psychologist and amateur astronomer in upstate New York, says that when we get kids in front of a telescope and they start asking questions, he says, then we know we've really done something. Lore, a PhD candidate and professional astronomer in Cape Town, says that when we look through a microscope, we're looking at the smaller components of which we are built. But when we look through a telescope, we're looking at the much larger universe around us of which we are a part. It's a completely different paradigm. So why does this matter? We wake up in the morning, we fix a cup of coffee, maybe we eat breakfast, maybe we don't. We take the kids to school, we go to work, six or eight hours later we come home, maybe we have time for the gym, maybe we don't. We try to fix dinner, we catch up on email, Facebook, we watch a couple of videos on YouTube, we do it again and again, day after day, week after week, year after year. Our taxes are still due, our phone bills are still due. Why does it matter if the universe was created 13 and a half billion years ago? Well, what if, back to the beginning, this was the edge of the world? And if I take one more step, you wouldn't see me again. What if beyond the Rocky Mountains, just on the other side of the western slope, was the edge of the world, or out in the Pacific Ocean beyond California? That would be a world filled with fear, in which we knew we could never go to that boundary, or we'd never come back. What if, as Catherine and so many others believe, we live inside a celestial sphere in which the entire universe is contained in a very small ball? What stories would we tell our children? What would be our mythologies, even our religion? What would be our hope for the future? Fortunately, the work of Galileo and Halley and Newton dispelled that and brought us into our modern understanding. Astronomy is unique in that it invokes a passion and a discussion about all the other sciences. So when we look through a telescope, we immediately engage physics and engineering. Physics for what we're seeing to explain the distant objects, and engineering to build the, uh, the, the instruments that we use. Telescopes are now some of the most advanced technology on the planet. 
doing stuff that Einstein himself said was impossible just 50 years ago, 60 years ago. When we look to our nearest neighbor, Mars, we see polar caps, we see waterways, we see deep canyons that were carved by massive amounts of water flowing. We recognize those patterns as ones we know very well here on Earth, and we're immediately invoking conversations of geology. When we look to distant stars, we see intermediate gas, we see interstellar gas, and we recognize the fingerprint of chemical compounds that we immediately recognize for being here on Earth. It's the same stuff. I don't know if you knew this, but 10 years ago, we sent a space probe through the tail of a comet, and we brought back a sample of that dust and that gas. And when we analyzed it, and they took two years to make certain they got it right, we found an amino acid, the building blocks of protein in life. As of this month, we've now discovered 1,800 planets orbiting other stars, some of which we actually know the chemical compounds of the atmosphere through spectroscopy, and we can surmise the ambient annual temperature. We now believe there are 11 billion planets that are Earth-like in our galaxy alone, 100 billion galaxies in the universe. Now we're talking about biology and, of course, philosophy and probably some religious debate, too. So I'd like to show Today, you part of a film. we are going to talk about the universe. So I want you now to close your eyes and imagine that you are in the night and you are viewing the sky. Close your eyes quickly. Whilst your eyes are closed, I want you to imagine the night. A very clear and beautiful night skies. They are getting a bigger picture. And I've been encouraging them to think out of the box. Let that curiosity develop the mind. Because that curiosity leads to investigative type of questions that make me later on make the learner realize a lot. a uh, segment of the film that brought me to your stage. I want to make it clear that what I've described to you as a lack of awareness of our place in the cosmos is not indicative to underprivileged schools in sub-Saharan Africa. It's, it's worldwide. It's with the well-educated as well. But everyone in this room will live to see our species become interplanetary. We will be living on the surface of Mars, working, living, even reproducing within 10, 12, some say 20 years. That journey started 400 years ago with the invention of a very simple instrument. And I would encourage all of you to look through a telescope, maybe for your first time, maybe if you haven't for a while, and embrace the conversations that unfold. Thank you. <laughs>